So uh, you heard about me in the intro. Let me add a little more. I joined WSO2 in November 2007, almost 11 years back. The first version of the WSO2 identity server was released in December the same year. A month later, I joined the company. My contribution for the first version was very minimal. I doubt I did anything more than just testing a couple of scenarios. Also, for the first version, we only had information card support. I would not expect most of you out here to know about information cards. Also, I won't be surprised if you hear about information cards for the first time. It's a dead standard. No one is using information cards today. Also, at the time it was at its peak popularity, it was not that popular. It's a standard brought forward by Microsoft in 2006 to address the phishing attacks on the web and declared to be dead in 2011 officially. It tried to introduce a fairly complex new paradigm for authentication to challenge against the username password-based systems. As you all know, security and user experience is always a continuous struggle. This was a moment where the user experience won. Even though information cards ended up as a failure, the need to find out a better, a robust, reliable way for identification, that never died. It's a little frustrating and also a shame the world has not been able to get rid of passwords for ages now. Everything what we have done ended up in a failure, mostly because none of those things were able to address the end-user requirements, end-user needs. So passwords been there for some time now, and, and it's becoming something really hard to get rid of. So there's a very simple theory in life. If we cannot get rid of something, then we find something to work with that, right? So that's where the multi-factor authentication comes in. MFA could reduce the account compromise by 99.99%. But sadly, 90% of Google users, they have not enabled two-factor authentication. In Google, they have many options. You can enable two-factor authentication with uh, OTP based on SMS, or you can use TOTP based Google uh, Authenticator app, or even FIDO. FIDO is becoming the de facto standard for uh, multi-factor authentication. Google, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of them do support FIDO to secure their internal applications and authenticate employees. Then again, even FIDO has failed to address the needs of the mass market. Today, we see a shift from MFA to continuous adaptive authentication. That, to some extent, would address our concerns on usability. If you take Facebook, for example, if you have enabled second factor authentication for Facebook login, then it may not require you to authenticate all the time with the second factor unless you change the device or you travel to another country. We are going to add adaptive authentication and risk-based authentication to WSO2 Identity Server 5.7.0, which will be released in Q3 this year. If you go back to information cards, once again, even though it's a dead standard, even though it's, it's no more use, it ended up in a failure, the time it was born, the time period 2005, 2006, it was, a, it was a time period where we started to see a lot of innovation happening in the internet I domain. How was the world look like before 2005? Facebook started in 2004, but it was not available to public till 2006. There was no YouTube, no Instagram, no WhatsApp, no Twitter, not even the Google Calendar. 
2005 is an important year in the software-driven economy we see today. It's also the start of the Web 2.0 era, where we started to see a shift from read-only web to read-write web. The businesses started exploring the opportunities to use internet as a platform for a broadened reach. And the consumers, they started using internet as a medium to reach those businesses in a much meaningful, deeper manner. These increased interactions between businesses and consumers over the web demanded identity communities to come up with standards to enable cross-domain communication and identity delegation. They were demanded to build standards. If you look at last decade or so, you might have noticed there's a rapid innovation happening in the identity domain. When I joined WSO2 in 2000, the very first task assigned to me was to add OpenID support to the identity server. OpenID was so popular by that time. We were counting the number of reliant parties or websites adding support to OpenID. The OpenID enabled population increased from millions to billions with the support from Google, Yahoo, and many other reliant parties. Interestingly, the very first WSO2 Identity Server customer used WSO2 Identity Server as an OpenID provider over a 4 million user base in Saudi. OpenID is an awesome standard, awesome invention, but no one is using today, it's other than Amazon. Having standards, a consensus is important. Standards help you build interoperability between systems. And also, it helps you to build best practices. But then again, standards are not here to stay forever. OpenID Connect replaced OpenID. OO2 replaced OO1. Skim replaced SPML. If the community feels supporting or adhering to a standard is an overkill, or that going to block their growth, they'll surely deviate from that. They'll start breaking rules, they'll start building their own rules, and someday, over the time, with the consensus of the community, those new rules will become standards. That's how, the, how things evolved in the past, and that's what's going to repeat in the future. The next most vulnerable standard is SACML. SACML is very powerful policy language for fine-grained access control. You can basically do anything with SACML. If you find your fine-grained access control requirements cannot be met with SACML, you relax, take a break, go read, reread SACML specification and come back. You can do it. SACML is that powerful. But then again, it has its own drawbacks too. That's why we see for some time, people are moving away from SACML and build their own policy languages for access control. AWS has its own policy language based on JSON. Then Open Policy Agent, or OPA, is one of the policy language for fine-grained access control on the rise, mostly popular in the microservices domain. And Netflix today uses OPA. Then SAML 2. SAML is by far one of the best standards for identity federation. Even after 13 years today, it's fighting to dominate the identity federation domain. But the stats from last few years, what we see is their dominance is going to fade out, and people are moving away from SAML to OpenID Connect. Most of the new applications developed in the last few years are only supporting OpenID Connect. 92% of the 8 billion plus authentication requests Microsoft Azure Active Directory handled in last May were generated by OpenID Connect and OO2O enabled applications. Standards are great and they keep evolving, that's fine. But the role of standards in building the foundation for communication, that is not changing. Ian Glaser from Salesforce, in one of his talks, talks about 
the TCP/IP moment of identity. TCP/IP was a luxury in early 1980s. If you had an application which supports TCP/IP, you had a competitive advantage over other applications. But today, who cares of TCP/IP? When you buy an application, you don't ask whether that application supports TCP/IP. It's given. You expect all the applications to support TCP/IP. The TCP/IP moment of identity is approaching. We are not there yet, but we'll get there. Most of the RFPs and RFIs we receive today, still there are many questions about OpenID, SAML, SCIM, O2, and all about the identity standards. But in the near future, no identity vendor will get any competitive advantage just by supporting open standards. Whatever the IAM product you pick, you can expect that to support open standards. If you look at how businesses grow today, it's mostly through acquisitions, mergers, and partnerships. So there are no more islands. You have to open up your businesses to your customers, partners, and suppliers, and maybe even to your competitors. Gartner predicts by 2020, 60% of all digital identities interact with your businesses will come from external identity providers. If you live in your own island, in your own comfort zone, maybe with decades-old technology and with some identity protocols, proprietary identity protocols preached to you by giant vendors who are afraid of losing you, it's you who is going to lose the battle. It's you who is going to lose the growth opportunities. That's why we see a trend today. Most of the large corporations, they are trying to build, break these barriers, break these silos, and they try to build enterprise-wide ID platforms based on open standards. It's, it's rather unlikely to have one identity standard dominate all the spaces in the ID domain. But this little magician in O2O is getting there. If I write an application today, let it be a web app, single page app, an IoT app, microservice, an API, I'm going to bet on O2O. O2O is becoming the glue for all the identity interactions. The beauty of O2O is its extensibility. That's why enterprises didn't go with O2O, no, but with O2O. O2O has multiple profiles. It's worth talking about Mobile Connect apart from the OpenID Connect profile. Mobile Connect is, in fact, a profile built on top of OpenID Connect, mostly promoted by GSMA. It's not popular in this part of the world, but it's getting momentum in Asia Pacific and also in Europe. With Mobile Connect, you can log into any application with your phone number. If you use your mobile device to access those websites, then the authentication will be seamless. You don't need to have any other credentials other than your SIM. So SIM is going to authenticate you to any, any web application which support Mobile Connect. In India, the top six mobile network operators, they are using WSO2 identity server to support Mobile Connect. And it's available in India for more than 800 million subscribers. That's a staggering number. But the reality is we haven't seen more than 20 million active subscribers using Mobile Connect. That's mostly because of the lack of support from service providers to Mobile Connect. It's a great idea to embed your identity to the mobile device itself or the SIM. We see the mobile adoption is unstoppable. It's going at a rapid speed. In 2017, the number of people connected to mobile services, it went past 5 billion. And the number is expected to reach 5.9 billion by 2025. So that's, 70, that's almost 71% of the world population, which is like three quarters of the global population. That's awesome. 
In 2014, David Birch writes a book called Identity is the New Money. There he argues, there he explains first the evolution of the mobile technology, and he argues why not we can use mobile phone and the SIM as money. If we can bind one's identity to the SIM, why can't we use it as money? Everyone we know today can be mapped to a 10-digit number. What's it? The phone number. We never call someone's office phone or home phone, right? We just call some person, some particular person. And we expect him to pick the phone and answer. We know exactly who we are calling, and the receiver knows who the caller is, looking at the caller ID. What Mobile Connect does is it binds the uh, a given user's identity to the SIM card or the mobile device, and also makes it portable. David Bird's argument to use mobile phone as money being realized by multiple initiatives globally. Aadhaar Pay is one such initiative, which is built on top of Aadhaar. Aadhaar is the digital identity initiative in India, which is also the largest in the world. More than 1.2 billion Indian residents, they have bound their identity to a 12-digit number, which is the Aadhaar number. The other program collects uh, name, date of birth, gender, address, and optionally, the phone number and uh, the email address. Then those are stored against the corresponding fingerprints and iris patterns. The objective of the other program is to build an identity layer, nothing more than that. It doesn't try to solve poverty. It doesn't try to solve hunger. It doesn't try to solve corruption. That's why Aadhaar is very popular and successful. If other services like government services, financial services, or retail services, if they want to build any applications, they can do that consuming the services provided by the Aadhaar layer. Aadhaar Pay is a digital payment platform for merchants, and it went live April last year with 20 banks in India. It operates in two modes. The first mode, the merchant owns a mobile device with the Aadhaar Pay app installed. So if you want to buy something, you go to the merchant, then when you are ready to pay, you enter your 12-digit Aadhaar number to the mobile app. Then you need to pick your bank from a, a given list of available banks. And you type the amount, then you authorize the payment using your fingerprint. That's it. The other mode is the user or the consumer owns the mobile device and the mobile app. And it's bound to your Aadhaar number and also to your bank. So you work, walk into the merchant. When you are ready, ready to play, pay, you scan the QR code from the merchant, which shares the merchant's bank details with the app. Then you, you type the amount and authorize the payment with your fingerprint. Aadhaar is by far the largest digital identity pro program in the world, and also it's the, it's the largest repository of biometrics. It's been criticized for being a centralized system under the government. But it's not just Aadhaar. If you look at, in USA, FBI under IAFIS program, they too collect biometrics. They collect uh, facial images, fingerprints, and also the physical characteristics like height, weight, eye color, hair color, even scars and tattoos. That store has more than 70 million plus criminal records and 34 million plus civil records. So it's not just Aadhaar. And also we have seen this trend across the globe. Many nations, many countries now building their own identity repositories for citizens. With the wake of Facebook and Cambridge Analytica scandal, there's a, there's a larger concern raised against privacy issues and also 
centralized user stores like Aadhaar and other systems who control your personal data centrally. Privacy is mostly about how much control you have over your personal data. It's quite straightforward. Either you control your personal data or someone else. Ownership means how much control you have over your personal data to decide when and with whom you want to share that data. If you go to the uh, Facebook and uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal, it's Facebook who decided when you share your personal data with a third party, the personal data of each and every individual in your friend list will also be shared with that third party implicitly with no further consent. That's how Facebook consent model worked some time back. And that's how Alexander Kogan was able to grab the personal data of more than 87 million Facebook users. Facebook is a centralized system. We have no control over that. Facebook can decide what to do with our data. We have two options. Either we stay there or we leave. That's why we need governments to step up and build privacy regulations. But then again, they are too, we have no control. There are a lot of lobbying happening. We don't know how much impact we can make on those. That's why today we see there's a discussion building on for self-sovereign identity. Christopher Allen, who is the author of the SSL specification, and also uh, well known for his work on uh, rebooting Web of Trust Foundation, in one of his papers talks about path to self-sovereign identity in four phases. It starts with centralized systems. That's what we see today everywhere. Facebook is a centralized system. Google is a centralized system. Aadhaar is a centralized system. That's, that's what we see everywhere today. Then you make centralized systems look a little better with federated identity. You let your users federate your identity from one place to another place. Microsoft Passport is one of the very first federated identity systems on the web. Even in that case, all your identity data are under the control of Microsoft, but it let you transfer your identity attributes from Microsoft to the connected reliant parties. Facebook do the same today. All your identity attributes are under Facebook, but with all two, you can federate your identity attributes to the connected service providers. Then came the user-centric identity model. In 2005, Kim Cameron, who is one of the distinguished identity architects at Microsoft, with the help of the community, came up with seven laws of identity. That laid the foundation for user-centric identity. In the user-centric identity model, user is in the middle of the identity transaction. You have the identity provider, you have the reliant party. Whenever you share any personal data from the IDP to the reliant party, you need to get the consent of the user. That's a push towards self-sovereign identity, but still not what we wanted. We don't have total control. Most of the systems we, to, we, we see today, we cannot find a clear, clear boundaries in those systems by the phases we discussed before. If you take Facebook, Facebook is a centralized system. It also allows you to federate your identity from one place to another place with your consent. Right? So what we see today is a combination of all these three phases. Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, all are centralized systems. These are distributed centralized systems, but not decentralized systems. Any kind of centralized system out there is a honeypot waiting to be attacked. If you run a centralized system today and not being attacked, consider yourself to be lucky. It's a matter of time, so be prepared. Also, the attacks we see today are quite different from what we observed in the past. If you take Cambridge Analytica, so there, the Cambridge Analytica didn't intrude Facebook to get access to 87 million personal data of 
Facebook users. That's quite different from the story we hear in the, in the uh, Equifax attack. Equifax was actually attacked, and the personal data, including social security numbers of 143 million American residents, were exposed. It's not just these kind of attacks worry us to stay in a centralized system. DNS is the best example. DNS is a centralized, distributed system owned by, governed by ICANN. During the wartime in Iraq and Afghanistan, US government was able to reassign the country TLDs of those two countries. And also, WikiLeaks was blocked in USA after the disclosure of diplomatic cables. China doesn't allow any social networking sites to operate in their country. Any country would take control of DNS whenever they want, whenever they think it should be. In Sri Lanka, Facebook was banned for more than 10 days, in a, couple of, a few months back. So what's the impact of relying on a centralized system? What would happen if Facebook is banned? It's not that somebody not being able to share their dining photos or favorite music with the friend list. There are more than 70 million businesses relying on Facebook. They rely on Facebook authentication and other services. If you block Facebook, then all those businesses will go bankrupt. One overnight decision can make a whole devastation, a catastrophe, for a, for a larger ecosystem who rely on centralized system. That's the risk we take. Then what's self-sovereign identity? The self-sovereign identity model pushes the control of the identity data to the edge. The owner of the identity data himself is in the control of the data. The identities themselves are in control of the identity data. You can establish a lifetime portable identifier with no central control and which cannot be taken away by anyone. In the self-sovereign identity architecture, we see six components. Holder is the owner of the identity data. It's you. So you first generate an identifier, a global unique identifier, which is known as DID or DID, Decentralized Identifier. And you attach a DID document to your DID, the identifier, and you publish this to public ledger. Public ledger is the blockchain. So it's really hard to talk about identity today without talking about blockchain. So I have to talk about blockchain too. So once you publish your DID to the, the blockchain, then you can go to the issuer. Issuer can be DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles. You go there, and DMV will create a digital copy of your driving license, and then give it back to you, a signed digital copy, and give it back to you, which is called the verifiable credentials. And then you store that verifiable credential in, in a repository under your control. It can be a wallet application running in your mobile device. Then the issuer will also commit a verifiable proof to the blockchain. That's the first phase. Then in the second phase, the holder goes to the inspector. Inspector can be a bank. So you want to open a bank account, you go to the bank, the inspector. And then you will present your verifiable credentials, which are stored in your wallet application, to the bank, the inspector. The inspector will validate all those credentials and also verify the verifiable proof committed to the blockchain by the issuer. If all goes fine, you can open an account. This is a very high-level overview of self-sovereign identity. And once again, this is, a, this is an evolving architecture. So we see three generations in blockchain. The blockchain one no is about currency. Bitcoin falls under blockchain one no. Then the blockchain two o is about contracts. Ethereum falls under blockchain two o. Blockchain three o is about applications beyond currency, finance, and markets. All the applications, or most of the applications that we develop to support self-sovereign identity architecture, they fall under generation three. The Sovereign Ledger, which is a blockchain implementation under Sovereign Foundation, 
it falls under blockchain trio and it tries to build a global network to support this self sovereign IT model. One of the challenges in the decentralized identity architecture is how to establish a unique, decentralized, memorable identifier. We haven't been able to do this in pre-blockchain -block era. The Suko Strangle says you cannot, in fact, do it. It says you cannot, you cannot create an identifier which satisfies all these three properties at the same time. For example, your Gmail address. It's unique, right? And it is, your Gmail address is unique. And also, it is human readable, it's memorable, but it is not decentralized, right? It's created by Google and it's under Google. Then a public key uh, you generate. It's unique, it's decentralized, it's you who created the public key. You didn't want to talk to any central authority, but it's not memorable. Then take a nickname. Nickname is human readable. It's decentralized. It's you who created that nickname, but it's not unique. So it's really hard to create an identifier to satisfy all these three properties together. With blockchain, you can do that. Blockstack is one such implementation. It's, in fact, a platform for decentralized applications built on top of Bitcoin, and the naming system in Blockstack is a critical component, and it supports creating identifiers to support all these three properties. So how do we make other or the centralized systems look better with blockchain? Sometime back, a reporter from uh, one of the news sites, he was able to get access to one billion records of other just by paying 500 rupees to an Aadhaar agent and getting his credentials. So just in 10 minutes, by paying 500 rupees, that reporter was able to get access to more than 1 billion user records in Aadhaar system. This is not just in India. One of the surveys done by SailPoint, it says one in seven employees would be willing to sell their login credentials for as little as $150. So how can we use blockchain to make these centralized systems much better rather than getting the total control away from the governments? That, that will not happen. If that doesn't happen, how can we apply blockchain to those systems? You can use blockchain in, in case of Aadhaar to make it publicly auditable. Any change that you do to the user record stored in blockchain you need to create some sort of a trace and commit that to blockchain so anybody can verify it. So I would know if my record gets changed in the other system. This is just a simple example. We see around the globe there are a lot of initiatives happening to bring blockchain to the real world. Estonia is one of the very first nations to, ex well, to start experimenting with blockchain. They started in 2008, and then they went live in 2012. Canada is testing a digital identity system based on blockchain. They are, in fact, uh, supporting part of this uh, known, known traveler digital identity program, and they use blockchain as an implementation. State of Illinois in US, Singapore, Dubai, and even the second phase of Aadhaar, they are considering to use blockchain. ID2020 is an initiative by United Nations. The objective is to give legal identities for everyone on Earth by 2030. There are more than 1.5 billion people around the world without a legal identity. That means they cannot, they cannot get education, they cannot open a bank account, they cannot open a business. Obviously, like, they don't exist. If you don't have a legal identity, you do not exist. So this program tries to give a legal identity to all these people around the world. And they try to build personal, private, persistent, portable identifiers using blockchain. Personal means it's only four, it's unique and only four. Private means you are totally in the control of the identifier. Persistent means it's for the lifetime. Portable means you carry it with you wherever you go. 
OK, finally, the takeaways. Identity and access management is a cross-vertical discipline and a key enabler for digital transformation. We need to stick to standard-based IAM for, for better interoperability and adhere to best practices. Identity-based payment systems are on the rise. Mobile phone, SIM is becoming an integral part of one's identity. Multi-factor authentication is a must, and we see the next phase, the continuous and adaptive authentication. Large-scale national digital identity systems are on the rise. Blockchain-based identity systems are mostly used by, by country level at the national level yet, and at the enterprise level, it's yet experimental. Identity is in the world. It's everywhere. No escape. Be prepared. Thank you. Question? Yeah. So we do have some time. If anyone has any questions, we can quickly take them. Well, we have one over here. So uh, you talked a little bit about blockchain. Uh, how is it going to fit in to your identity server model? Because identity server is becoming a, uh, is more like a hosted application, whereas blockchain is a pub public or a private or consensus network, right? So how is it going to play into that? Yeah. So one challenge we face in blockchain is how, how we can leverage this blockchain identity to the real world. So we are experimenting at WSO to see how we can integrate blockchain identity to, to, to the SAML-based, OpenID Connect-based federation flows. So I, I have done a webinar, uh, so maybe I can share the links with you. But in detail, like in summary, what we do is identity server connects to the blockchain. Right? The service providers, they can use SAML, OpenID Connect, or any federation standards. So they redirect the user to identity server. The identity server will challenge the user. Right? So you send some challenge. Then the user will sign it with the corresponding private key, which is where you have committed the public to the blockchain, and also will share with us the DID, the DID. Then the identity server looking at the DID can discover where the DID document is and will find out the public key. Right? Then looking at the DID document, we can also find out to, to where to fetch the user's attributes. Then after that, we create a similar response or an open ID connect response, embed those attributes, and share it that with the reliant party. So the service providers, they need not to worry about blockchain. Identity server will handle that. The end users, they own the identity, and they can take your identity to enterprise service providers. So that's one of the POCs we are working on. So, Prabhat, if you are moving into self-sovereign identity at a large scale, at a large user base, who do you think should drive that effort? Yeah. So, at the moment, that's mostly driven by the community. If you take uh, the sovereign ledger, so there's a non-profit organization called Sovereign Foundation. So, it's the community who drives this effort. So, that's what even happened to any standards, right? So, OAuth was driven by community. Scheme was driven by community. So that's how things get started. Then you get the backup from governments. So governments will be the users, and the large-scale enterprises, they will be the users. Then, then it will become mainstream. So it will take some time. Still, the blockchain-based identity is at the national level. And enterprise level, it's experimental. So it will take some time to be mainstream. Uh, you talked about this adaptive, continuous MFA is evolving towards that, right? Now, those type of technologies, are they going to be built in within the identity server, or is it something people who are using the you know, WSO2 to build more value-add applications, they'll have to do something to take advantage of those type of features? Yeah. With 5.7, no. We are going to support adaptive authentication and risk-based authentication. What we do there is, if you are familiar with uh, the identity server, right? 
So when you define multiple steps, you can I didn't say support multi-factor authentication now. You can define multiple steps. What we are going to do is we let you control that authentication flow with JavaScript. So in JavaScript, you will get access to the user context, the HTTP request, the, con the complete flow. Then you can decide in the JavaScript itself how you want to change the flow based on different parameters. These parameters can be the IP address range. right? So you can say, if it is coming from a local IP, then just use username and password. If it is outside the IP range, then use a second factor. And also, we are going to support risk-based authentication. So we are going to use our stream processor as our risk engine. And we have a JavaScript function where you can enable from the identity service management console to talk to the risk engine. But then again, we are not going to couple to our risk engine. If you have your own risk engine somewhere, then you can extend the identity server to talk to those APIs and get a risk code. Once you get the risk code to the identity server, once again to the JavaScript, you can control the flow. So that's what we are going to plan to our next, for our next, next release in Q3 this year.